So what I want to talk to you about today are flying snakes. Um, but before I get into that, I wanted to thank a bunch of people um, and funding agencies um, over the years. Um, I really appreciate the support. And I want to give credit to all of the collaborators that I've worked with. Um, these are just some of the faculty, uh, my PhD students and postdoc who have worked on snake projects over the years. And of course, I've had countless undergrads and high school students and high school teachers as well. So I want to thank all of them. Okay, so um, the main question here involves animals that live um, at heights. Um, so when you live in trees and you climb around, you have to, uh, if you want to get from place to place, you encounter gaps, okay? And gaps can be a problem, particularly if you're way high up in the trees and you have the, the issue of potentially falling down to your death. So the question here is, what, what do you do when you reach a gap? Okay, so this is sort of a broad question that my um, lab has been asking over the years, leading to many different types of studies. One of these lines of work involves um, gliding. So this is a flying snake, it's, it's on a branch and we're releasing it into the forest here and you can see it looks around, it jumps and then it takes off gliding and away it goes back into the forest. Um, the height here is about 50 feet in the air or so, um, 15 meters or so. Okay, so um, gliders are not specialized just to snakes, of course. Um, you've probably heard of some of the others like um, uh, things like uh, flying mammals, flying squirrels. This is a kaluga, but there's also frogs and lizards. Um, there's um, arthropods like um, spiders. Um, there's also flying fish and squid, which are really bizarre. Um, so gliding has evolved many, many times, okay? Many more times than you have it in, in um, active flight, like something like a bird, bat, or an insect. Now, um, traditionally in the literature, the... Um, Gliding has been thought of in sort of in simple terms. It's like simple flight. So you have um, lift produced by the animal um, and you have it in, in drag as well. So drag is slowing it down. Um, but when the weight of the animal um, equals the, the vector sum of the lift and drag, then you have an equilibrium and the animal is just moving at a, at a constant glide angle um, with this convenient set of uh, simple equations. However, um, real gliding by real animals is not so simple. Um, here's an example from a flying squirrel, a really nice study. Um, and the issue here is that uh, the animal jumps off and it's not in equilibrium. Um, it might attain an equilibrium in part of its glide, but then it does things like maneuvers to get itself into position to land. Um, and what you see here is a very nonlinear set of um, trajectories. So we've been... Um, answer trying to answer similar questions in snakes so let me introduce you to these characters so these are flying snakes and what you can see here um, these are um, four species shown with these images there's one that i don't even have a photo of in some total there's there's nominally five they're not that big they're they're um around the 100 gram um, scale uh, and about uh, one meter in length um, and when they do get large, they don't become as good uh, gliders. Uh, the animals live in, in South and Southeast Asia from Southern China all the way down through Indonesia and then parts of, of India as well. And then, um, you know, as I said at the beginning, these are animals that live in trees. Um, so they're taking advantage of, of gravity and turning their potential energy into kinetic energy during, during the glide. So let me show you um, a couple more glide sequences just to show you what we're dealing with here. This is an overhead view of a flying snake. This is uh, one of my uh, very first recordings um, in my first year of working on this way back in 1997. And you can see here that the animal is moving its head back and forth and it's creating these very large amplitude waves. They're traveling waves that are sent down the body. Uh, here's another movie. And this one is jumping off a stick and the snake is gonna come straight at you. Um, and that one flies over the, the head of the, the cameraman there. Um, now, in addition to straight gliding, they can also do things like maneuvers. So here is one that is um, jumping into the air and we have it painted with three little paint dots so that we can do 3D tracking on it later on. And you see it glide, glide right past. Um, the, the target that we wanted to aim for. 
Now they can also do really sharp turns as well if those are early in the trajectory. And you can see here, the animal sort of jumps straight out and then there's a, a movement of the tail and we now have a 90 degree turn. So pretty spectacular. So the issues here are, um, that, that um, we're concerned about um, in terms of the, its mechanics are, how does the snake generate aerodynamic forces and how does it control its glide? And one thing to note here is that any other glider that you can think of, or, or even active flyers here like this bird, um, if you look at them from a, a top view or underneath, what you see is a left-right symmetry. Okay, so whatever is being created on the left side can be created on the, on the right side in terms of forces. And that is one uh, mechanism that they use for being able to control um, their, their flight. Um, if you freeze frame the snake in the air, you can see that there's no left-right symmetry um, um, across the body. And the same thing is true um, from um, fore to aft, but that's also true in these, these other flyers, flyers as well. Okay, so the first piece of this puzzle is about the animal's body shape. And so when the flying snake um, enters the air, it does so by jumping. And here's a jumping takeoff. And as it's jumping, what it's doing is transforming its body. It flattens out from its head all the way to where its tail starts. And the tail does not flatten out because it does not have um, ribs in it. Ribs are what are, are um, controlling that, that body shape. So if we look at, the, at a picture of the snake from below, what you can see here is that uh, from the head to the, the tail there is, is flattened. And we zoom in a little bit, this is the, the snake's resting width. So at, at maximum, it's, it's about a doubling in width. And if we take a look at the body in a, um, in a front view, you can see this sort of triangular shape of the snake. It's, so it's a quite unusual snake um, aerodynamically. Um, here's a, a depiction of the snake. This is a cartoon version of the snake um, in its rounded section, superimposed with it being flattened. And you can see the action of the ribs there is what is what is inducing this. And then if you just look as, at a 2D cross section, you have this sort of flying saucer type um, shape that's really quite uh, quite unusual for a flyer. So um, so that's a big piece of the puzzle. And we, we spent um, a lot of time trying to understand what the implications are of this shape, both in, in two dimensions and, and three dimensions. So we, we have done um, physical modeling studies where we measure forces on 2D models. And then um, we've also done computational work um, in 2D, um, as well as looking at um, three dimensions um, in the snake, uh, or looking at this in three dimensionally as well, um, with more uh, recent immersed boundary method um, type studies. Um, we've also done um, in this in this sort of uh, physical model, we've looked at um, single foils as well as double foils to try to simulate where the, the snake's body is and its uh, potential interactions with its own body, the, the wake interactions. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the results. This is from, uh, from our 2D studies. And this plot here, what you're looking at is angle of attack versus the lift, lift coefficient. So how much how much lift force can the thing generate? An angle of attack is the orientation of this object with respect to the, the, the airflow. So if the airflow is coming this way um, on this model, the angle of attack would be zero. Imagine if we flip this to the 90 degrees so that it's um, straight into the wind and that's that's what 90 is, which is off the, off the axis here. Um, so the interesting parts of this plot are that at zero in this orientation, it actually has negative lift. So this is a bad orientation. It would push, push the snake downward. Um, it starts generating positive lift around 10 degrees. And then as you angle this up more and more, what you see is that the lift coefficient goes up until you reach a peak around 35 degrees. And then there's a gentle drop off as well. So this is kind of interesting because um, if you look at a more typical airfoil, uh, like a, the wing of a Cessna, say, um, one that's symmetrical, so zero lift at zero degrees, and then the lift increases pretty um, quickly, and then it stops here around 20 degrees, meaning that if you tilt that wing up too, too high, you'll get um, stall and you'll stop producing lift. So the snake looks a, a lot different than your, your typical wing. Part of this is that it's at a different Reynolds number, which means that it's operating 
at a smaller size and smaller flow speed. And so essentially the fluid mechanics there are, are um, what the, uh, what this shape is experiencing is different than what that, that Cessna is, is experiencing. Now, if we were to look at drag, so, so how much force is, is, is uh, slowing this thing down um, in, the, in the direction of motion, so what you see here is that the, the drag coefficient is generally, it's pretty similar across a, a broad range of, of angles. And then at this 35 degrees, it starts to increase. So you have a dra drag crisis as well. And when you put those two together, if you look at the, the ratio of lift to drag, and that really tells you the, is a better indication of the, of the performance of the, of the foil itself. What you see is sort of a broad range where you get good lift to drag. Um, so this this partly explains why the snake is able to achieve its its performance. Um, now, one more note about this: um, this is sort of a there's a lot to handle here. So this is Reynolds number, so the combination of um, size and speed, and this is the the lift coefficient, the maximum. And what you see here, this is so this is a plot for a lot of different types of shapes. What you see is that for this sort of standard foil here, what you'd more expect for um, an airplane wing, that at that Reynolds number, at that size and speed, the snake outperforms it, which is sort of a shocking, um, a, a shocking result. Um, if you were to scale this up, so make this make this shape much larger, um, it would start to fail. Um, so this is not advisable. I don't think we're going to see airplanes with snake-shaped wings um, anytime soon. Small models, sure, but but not not large ones. Um, so this is this is pretty pretty interesting. Um, now, one more note about this: the effect of this shape is that um, it's for the snake. It's actually um, advantageous. Now. To understand that, we, we're going to freeze frame the snake in the air. And in terms of the body axis, the, the right side of the body is here and the left side of the body is here. Then the left side of the body is here and the right side of the body is there. And so if you imagine now the airflow, airflow coming over this body here, um, we have the leading edge to the trailing edge here, right? And so um, there's going to be some angle that the snake is taking and so it's generating lift. But as the snake undulates, so it's doing that swimming-like motion in the air, imagine that the, the body is going to flip, okay? So at a time later on in its, uh, in its, its undulation cycle, um, its right side has now flipped to the other side and the left side has flipped to the other side. And so effectively, the, the leading edge and trailing edges have changed places. Um, so... If you are a symmetrical shape in cross section, that's actually the way that you want to be. So imagine you have an airplane wing, and you now flip it around so that the the little thin edge is facing the the, the wind. That's a bad situation because the the that shape is not does not do well um, in in particular for going in in the other direction. But for the snake, it's it's actually advantageous. Okay. Um, a next uh, major question in terms of its mechanics are, what are the snake's stability characteristics? Um, and you're thinking about this, I've been talking about airplanes a little bit. Um, passenger jets are designed to be passively stable. So if you have a, a some turbulence or a wind gust here that, that, um, that tilts the plane into roll in one direction, say, it passively wants to return back to its original condition. Whereas fighter jets are designed to be um, passively unstable, so you have to have active control in order to fly these. And the trade-off is that you're then highly maneuverable. Um, passenger jets, on the other hand, are not highly maneuverable. So, um, so how about the snake? So um, one of the prominent features of snakes undulating in the air is that they are doing this, um, this highly dynamic uh, behavior where they, they're creating these big waves and sending them down the body. These are the traveling waves. Um, so this is this is unusual for something that's flying in the air. And um, we spot a, spent a lot of effort trying to understand what the implications of this undulation are for the snake. Now, there is a, there is a null hypothesis here, which is that the snake is, uh, it's a, the flying snake is just a snake 
And what snakes do is they move their bodies from side to side. That's how they, they move on the ground or on trees or in the water. That's what they do. So the snake could just be being a snake in the air. And it's like, hey, I'm a, I'm a snake. I'm going to undulate. Um, so the question here is there is there a mechanical um, function of this undulation as well? Okay, so um, some of our early models. Um, so we've built up over the years. And a lot of the basis for these models have been the, the lift and drag coefficients from our 2D um, um, fluid mechanics type studies. So in this model, um, we have, uh, we're, we're assuming the snake is just a, a flat piece and then a flat piece, and then one in the middle that's oriented a little bit differently. And then um, area is is moved from one place to the other to sort of simulate the effect of, of undulation. Okay, so, so we have area here and we have area here, which we're, we're calling mass effectively. Um, and then um, we've had other models where we, we've, we've considered them as links. So this is a simple three-link model. This is um, multi-links. Um, and these are all relying here on the lift and drag coefficients um, from those 2D studies. The upshot of these um, first modeling efforts is that the, the snake is inherently unstable, but you can see here, these are sort of, um, you know, they're, they're first past, uh, first past um, uh, sort of crude models. So I wanna introduce you um, to a slightly more sophisticated model that we developed. And the way that we did it is we um, we got better kinematics from the snake and then um, developed a new model from those very fine um, kinematics. And this work was actually done in an art center here at Virginia Tech. So this, this is a big, um, a big auditorium here, but behind here is this facility called the cube. And if you look inside of the cube, um, it's this large open space. It's, it's technically it's a black box theater, and we line the floor with foam. And the nice thing about this this um, theater at Virginia Tech is that they they um, equipped it with motion capture cameras, um, not anticipating that they'd be flying snakes in there, but um, you know the, the sort of the the uh, build it and they will come type approach. Um, so we took full advantage of this facility. Um, so you could take those motion capture um, cameras and you can arrange them any way you want inside the facility. And also we could put cameras up above um, on this sort of steel walkway, which is pretty neat. Um, so we have these cameras arranged um, custom in a custom way for our glide trials. And you're probably aware of motion capture um, from um, video games and animated movies and cartoons and things like that. Um, we could not use little reflective spheres because we thought it would interfere with the snake's aerodynamics. Instead, we used tape on the animal, and that seemed to work out well. And so we're sampling down the, 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 the animal um, uh, 11 to 17 um, markers there. Okay, so um, after a bunch of work, so I'm skipping um, about 100 steps here. This is what we got um, out of that, of that experiment. So you're looking at a glide from above. And so here we've we've um, fit a bunch of things onto those those points there, um, and now we're rotating this to the side. Um, so here is our our snake in side view. So this is what a, what a glide trial looks like, um, and, and effectively the 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 this is in the reference frame of the snake that you're looking at. Um, and then I'm going to move this here, and we're going to look at a rear view of the snake in the air, and you can see its sort its body and its its individual foils sort of. Um, moving up and down and crossing over each other. It's a it's quite unusual um, for a flyer. Okay, so from that model, we were able to develop a, a continuous model. Um, so this this is not using the exact um, kinematic movements of the snake. We've instead um, effectively it's a series of sine and cosine waves. Um, so this is a more idealized. Um, uh, model of the snake, uh, but it is based on the kinematics that we got from the body there. And then again, we were using um, lift and drag characteristics that we discovered before. Um, and this time, though, in accounting for the curvy parts, we're using simple sweep theory, where, where effectively we're only looking at the orthogonal component of the of the air, air's velocity 
um, in calculating the lift and drag coefficient. So, so for example, at this, this point in the curve here, um, we would be getting uh, no lift um, and, and drag only effectively. Um, and in this model, we also are, are taking account to where the, the mass of the snake is um, because the effectively, you can think of this like a, a rope that's being slung around um, with, with a fair amount of mass away from the center of mass. Um, and there is a substantial inertial effect um, um, from that, the undulation of the snake as well. Okay, so here are some results. So the nice thing about um, this type of model is you can do experiments um, virtually on the snake that you couldn't do in real life. And the, the, the virtual experiment that we're gonna do here is to ask, well, what if you turned off undulation? Okay, so in this simulation, this is gliding with undulation. And we're gonna look at the, the buildup of lift and drag forces on the model. And then correspondingly, we're gonna look at the trajectory of the snake. So this is a side view. So this is um, the height, the vertical, and this is horizontal or, horizontal or, it's, or it's forward, forward motion. And then we're plotting the center of mass of this system. So we're, the snake is released at the same speed that it goes in real life. You see lift and drag build up and you see the snake in its trajectory. And this is a fairly steep one, um, but this actually looks pretty similar to what the snake does in reality. Now this model here, you start to see that it, it gets a little bit wobbly, but it stays under control. So the model is not perfect in terms of um, replicating what, this, what the real snake does. Now, the, the more important piece here though is, is gliding without undulation. So now we do the experiment of launching it with the same initial velocity and we let lift and drag build up on it and we see what happens. So off it goes, no undulation. So the snake is just still and we see the lift and drag being built up. And now you have moments on the snake that cause a very large rotation and there's no way for the snake to counter that. And so you get this trajectory here where the snake is now um, you know, 90 degrees to where it should be, We're, effectively it's tumbling in the air and we stop the simulation because the snake is completely out of control. Um, so this shows us here that that undulation is important for stability. And effectively this is a dynamic stability whereby the center of mass is moving back and forth and you're getting all these lift and drag forces and you're getting um, the mass of the snake that are cause, causing different moments on the snake. But on average, they are, um, they're, they're summing so that, the, that all of those forces are counterbalanced by the mass and you get a stability of the snake. So there is a function of this undulation and that's to keep the animal stable in the air. And with that, um, that's that's what I have today for my slides, and I'm I'm happy to take any questions. Well, let's uh, thank Jake uh, for this very interesting, uh, wonderful talk. So uh, uh, while we uh, so we have uh, one question from Ashok. Do you want to just uh, mute yourself and ask? Sure. Uh Fascinating talk. Uh, this is this is amazing. I was just wondering whether uh, the undulations could have some other purpose, you know, just some because of aerodynamic coupling, uh, even uh, like like drafting for cyclists, for example. So mm. you know, even, even though air is thin, uh, it is something that yeah, there is aerodynamic coupling, right? As we know, right. Um... That's a great question. Um, and I didn't show anything on any results on that today. Um, we have some evidence for that happening, um, but when it would happen would be later in the trajectory. So initially in the trajectory, when the animal is going at sort of at a, at a steep angle, the the orientation of the, of the wake is such uh, that it's not interacting with the back of the body. Uh, okay, right. But as the, as the snake shallows out and you get these, these uh, these more horizontal glides. It's not quite horizontal, but it's okay. it's at, at it's at a less steep angle. At that point, you start to get potential interactions between the wake of the forebody and the 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 back pieces. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So those those are going to become more relevant, and um, the exact quantitative importance 
of that interaction is is still something that we're we're working on. We're trying to do new experiments to get better kinematics when the animal is not going at the steep uh, portion, but at a more shallow portion, in mm -hmm. order to answer that that um, that coupling question. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, so we have the next question from Ria Samantha. Uh, Ria, would you like to ask, unmute and ask, or? Okay, so I can read the question. So uh, what would be the effect of different wind speeds on snake behavior while gliding? That's that's a great question. Um, I don't know. We've taken great pains to try to do our experiments with in still air. <laughs> um, but we also want to, at some point, we want to work on uh, perturbation. So what happens when you get a wind gust or what happens when you have sort of a steady wind? Um, you know, um, mechanically, that's interesting on its own. There's, there's also a question about do they actually glide when it's windy outside, right? Um, so they're, you know, that I, I, you know, I, I didn't say this during experiments, but but oftentimes the snakes don't want to glide. Okay, uh, so what motivates them to glide? We don't actually know in 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 the in the wild. Uh, but we, in our experiments, there's times where we put the snake out there and the snake will go out and they'll say, nope, I just want to come back. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so it's quite possible that, that they can sense uh, a, a steady wind or, or gusts or anything, and they decide not to glide. Um, so those are, those are very big open questions. I, I don't have any, any answers for you. Have you maybe tried to like, uh, you know, blow some wind to them and and uh, count the prob the the frequency that they want to go and not want to go <laughs> with wind or without wind <laughs> uh that's an experiment that we can do um and i have i have a new student um in our biotrans program actually mm -hmm. who's going to be studying jumping and that's that's actually an experiment that would be quite amenable um to his his jumping work uh, because it doesn't involve a long glide it just simply is it asking the question, are they less likely to jump when there's there's more wind? And we can do that, we can do that in the lab even. I see. Um, so the next question is from Kimberly Bowell. And this is uh, also kind of in a similar line of a question that I have in my mind. So Kimberly's question is, to what extent do snakes have to learn how to glide effectively? And my question is that you mentioned when they become bigger, they actually don't glide anymore. So uh, what do they do? Do they kind of know? Okay, I'm too big. <laughs> I well, guess. no, I uh, I didn't mean to say that they when they when they're large they don't glide. They just don't glide as as well. So the the snakes that that achieve the the most horizontal glides and you know that can glide farthest um, are the smaller snakes. Um, and uh, do they learn it? Probably not. We have we have caught very small snakes. And so the small snakes are ones that probably hatched out of their eggs recently. Um, so literally, literally ones that are that are the size of, of a pen. And they do all the same behaviors. They do that same jump. Um, they undulate in the air and they get pretty good distance as well. They don't they aren't the maximum flyers. So ones that are slightly bigger are actually able are 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 better gliders in terms of their ability to to cover horizontal distance. Um, but a smaller snake might be might glide farther than a a larger heavy snake. Uh, but in terms of learning, I don't I they probably don't do much. I think they come out of the egg knowing how to do this behavior. Um. So I guess uh, we can take the last one in the chat. Uh, this is from Joshua. Uh, so he's asking, just curious, if you were to release the snake upside down, could it flip over like a cat? Uh, can it twist as well as undulate? How does it maintain an appropriate foil angle for its different sections? Um, well, if you give me if you give me a second, um, I can actually pull up. If I think I can find a video quickly for you. I can. Okay. Let me share my screen again.
Okay, so this was this was a snake that um, I did not realize at the time was at the start of a shed, and they start their eyes start to go cloudy, um, and they tend to want to just hide and and don't do anything while they're while they're shedding. So this one didn't want to glide. Um, and what you can see is it comes out and it 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 does a tumble. Its belly is sort of yellow. And so you can see that the belly, you can see the belly there, it tumbles out, it flattens out, it gains control of itself, and then it starts to glide. Okay, this is this is a really a really remarkable sequence. Um I'll show it one more time, off it goes. Um so I have a partial answer to that. So I do think that th so they can they can recover if they're not in the proper orientation. We have not done any systematic studies, though, to place them in that orientation and then to see how they do it. Um, but effectively, I mean, if if you think about, um, you know, what a cat is doing in, in, in these these um, uh, reorientations in the air to get itself um, uh, in, in the right position, lots of animals um, are able to do these these um, writing um, orientations um, to get themselves in in the right position. Um, but we do we do have plans to do experiments where we effectively get sort of a trap door and we have the snakes on a height of, of course you know have padding below so they don't hurt themselves but then release them and then and then figure out how they move their body to get themselves in the proper position so right. that's that's in our um that's in our sites of experiments to do right but but a cat couldn't do it without legs like if if a cat was just <laughs> A cylinder, it couldn't do it, right? It has to, um, you know, angular momentum conservation. You know, the trick it uses requires. Well, but but the cat has a tail as well, right? So I think with the, yeah. you know, in, in in this type of work has been done on um, on geckos, and geckos are are shockingly good at this type of reorientation. Um, so in these experiments, the gecko was upside down and there was a little impulse that was given to, to knock them off and they get their bodies back, flip back over um, within a couple of, of body lengths. But they're using primarily their tail rather than their legs, which are kind of short, shorter in, in relation to the length of their body. Um, so I think the snake is effectively, you know, it's it's one long tail. Um, so it has all it has all kinds of. It has all kinds of options for how it can potentially do its its reorientation.